Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics on this perhaps ironically sunny morning. Um, my name is Adam Posen. I'm the president of the Peterson Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone for a, not just here in person, but also online, and we hope referring to these talks and these videos in weeks ahead for our discussion of income inequality and inclusive growth, we are jointly organizing this with McKinsey Global Institute, whom we're very proud to partner with on a recurring basis as topics of common interest come up. And it is very difficult to imagine a topic of more common and public interest than this one, which is what is the state of inequality? What can be done about it if the new administration chooses to be growth friendly, as they call it? what actually could be done on the growth side that would reduce inequality without killing growth. Um, we have a number of speakers from both the public sector and academia as well as the, uh, our friends from McKinsey and of course the Pearson Institute's own authors. In particular, I want to welcome Paul Krugman who has graciously months ago agreed to do this event with us and will be of course be giving our luncheon keynote at 12.15 after the elephant diagram. Um, again, we chose this topic and this event months ago, um, and we are all the more reason to talk about it today than before. Uh, we're going to format this session in this conference in three sessions. There's going to be a panel on income inequality assessing what's going on and what we know about the sources of it, and obviously in an international context, but focused on the US. My colleague, Carolyn Freund, senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute, who's done some fascinating work on uh, economic transformation and the rise of corporate leaders, both leading corporations and corporate leaders in development, uh, will chair that session, and she will introduce the main speakers, but they include Anu Madhgavkar from McKinsey Global Institute, the author of their study on inequality, Sandra Black, the Honorable Sandra Black, member of the Council of Economic Advisors, who has been in deeply involved in the CEA's fascinating work on monopsony and on inequality and on corporate competition, and Paolo Moro, now back at the African Department of the International Monetary Fund, late of the Peterson Institute, who did a study for us while he was here the last two years on global income distribution, projecting it forward, and we have his new book coming out early in the new year on that topic. I don't mean to take away from Carolyn's bio, sorry. Um, <laughs> maybe she can skip those and go right to substance. That will run till 10.15. We're then going to have a coffee break, uh, then follow with a policy forward-looking in terms of recommendations for inclusive growth policies. I'll be chairing that, and then I will do the intros then, but it'll include Brad DeLong from UC Berkeley, William Spriggs, Chief Economist of the AFL-CIO, Jonathan Wutzel of McKinsey Global Institute, who also has a new publication from them on inclusive growth, and our newest senior fellow, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, late of the German Ministry of Economics. We then provide a free lunch, which you're expected to get from the buffet quickly, and then we have the speech by Paul. Uh, two more ground rules before we start. First, everything we do here is on the record. Um, not everything we do in this building, everything we do in this room is on the record, and that includes today. Uh, we will have set aside each session and after Professor Krugman's speech, time for our audience in person to ask questions and make comments. I ask my colleagues, as usual, to let our outside guests have the first couple questions before they put forward their own questions. And we ask that people asking questions or making comments uh, identify themselves and keep them brief. The more it sounds like a comment than a question, the more likely I am to cut you off. The more it sounds like a question, the more likely you are to have time to complete your statement. Uh, on that note, let me say thanks, and let me turn it over to Carolyn to convene the first panel. Uh, thank you, Adam. I'm very excited to host this morning's panel. Um, there's been so much discussion around U.S. incomes uh, recently, and so much is based on perceptions and on very specific groups. 
And the really nice thing about the McKinsey report is that it's evidence-based and it really covers the vast majority of workers. And, and what this report shows is that the anxiety of the American worker is much broader than the old white male that we've been hearing so much about during the election. The American economy has grown slowly and the vast majority of people, 80%, have not seen their incomes grow since 2005. And the US isn't alone. This is the case in a number of European economies as well. So what I would say I take from this is that, in fact, stagnation is a big part of the problem. And it's really important to note that inequality hasn't risen. So whether you measure it as the genie or whether you measure it as the share of the top 1%, the share of the top 1% actually hasn't risen since 2000, since China joined the WTO, since PNTR. So I think a lot of the blame that's being thrown at globalization is really about some other issues as well. We know as economists it, there are many issues that drive inequality, whether it's a sort of mating, whether it's deregulation. Um, uh, there are so many issues that feed into inequality beside globalization, technological change, automation. So I just wanted to say that to open the conference because I think it's really important as economists that we always emphasize this clearly even if we do believe globalization is part of the problem, it is not the main part of the problem. And I think it's important to remember that. The other thing I really loved about reading this report is it reminds us that women still have it worse than men, and especially the single women. Um, single moms are much more prevalent at the bottom of the distribution, and let's not forget that. So before I take any fire from the report, let me just, Adam already mentioned who the people are. I'll just remind you. We have Anu Madhvakar, who is a partner at McKinsey Global Institute. She joined in 2011 and leads teams based in India, working on global as well as India-focused research. She's co-authored a number of reports, many on India, but the one today is on the US and uh, other countries. Sandra Black is a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. She's on leave from the University of Texas, Austin, where she holds the Audrey and Bernard Rappaport Centennial Chair in Economics and Public Affairs and is a professor of economics. Her research focuses on the role of early life experiences on the long run outcomes of children, as well as issues of gender and discrimination. So she'll be an excellent discussant for this report. And finally, Paolo Mauro is an assistant director in the IMF's Africa department. We know him here as a colleague. He was a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute from December 2014 to August 2016. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, World on the Move, which forecasts inequality into the future based on demographic changes, as well as need for infrastructure. And I'm sure that will be an exciting book that we'll be releasing very soon. Thank you. So why don't we, I won't come back up again. We can just run through the speakers now. While I get this to work, uh, thanks very much, Caroline, and a very good morning to everybody who's here. <clears throat> oh, thank you. It's the other one. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we as McKinsey Global Institute are absolutely very glad to be here to talk about a topic which, uh, as Adam pointed out, uh, is of great common and public interest uh, and is clearly also very topical given the events through 2016, both in the US as well as other parts of the world. But as our research suggests, the underlying forces or the trends and root causes of many of these uh, 
issues that we will discuss have been uh, building up and gathering pace over a longer period. Uh, and the solutions or you know, how, how we really address them, given the scale of some of these issues, is actually uncharted territory and may demand some bold and unorthodox solutions going forward. Uh, so that said, as we thought about uh, the question of income inequality, I think the first perspective is really that uh, there are different ways in which inequality can be viewed and different ways in which inequality is actually experienced and perceived by people. Um, in the, much of the developing parts of the world, I come from India, uh, inequality is really um, you know, most acutely experienced as the question of do I have enough to get by? So the concept of a minimum living standard, the concept of what constitutes that minimum acceptable living standard and how many people can, can, can actually achieve that is the dominant lens through which inequality is, is kind of viewed and addressed. But in the developed economies, which this research actually focus, focuses on, um, this is, 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 is not an insignificant question, but relative poverty has actually remained fairly stable over the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, and, and therefore, much of the research and thinking around inequality has actually focused on the, the polarization of incomes between uh, the richest segments and then others who are you know, not so rich. Um, and while, while much of the research has focused on this, as we thought about it, it did seem that first, this has been more or less a steadily increasing trend for much of the time since the mid 70s onwards. This chart suggests, for example, that the share of the top 1% in the US of income has actually been rising over a, over a longish period of time, and that's, that's a fact. Nothing dramatically has changed in the last 10 years. And it's also a fact that even as this happened, there was a broadly held conviction or belief for most people that even if this was true, you would end up being better off over a period of time than you were in the past, and that you would end, off, uh, end up being better off as a generation compared to where your parents were, and that your children would also be better off than you are. So there was a sense of advancement and of progress, and to some extent, we believe that that might have mitigated some of the perception as well as the experience of this aspect of inequality, which we've actually seen. So what has actually changed in the last um, 10 years or so is this notion of economic advancement. Uh, what we did in this research is to think about households uh, in groups or segments or cohorts, and to say that was a certain type of household actually better off in, let's say, 2014 or 15, compared to where similar households were placed 10 or 15 years ago, and did that actually change? And we find that if you think about the period from the mid-90s up until 2005, um, virtually all households actually made progress in terms of their incomes. We look here at incomes through wages and sources of capital income, and therefore in terms of earned incomes, less than 2% of households had flat or falling incomes from the mid-90s up un until 2005. We looked at this question across North America as well as countries in Western Europe, but for this set, there was certainly progress in that period. But a striking difference from the period 2005 up to 2014, where 65 to 70% of households actually were either the same or worse off compared to similar households roughly 10 years ago. Now, um, a clarification, we don't actually have the ability to track individual households. So I don't have the ability to say that 70% of the households were actually individually worse off than where they were 10 years ago. But we did look at households in terms of the income distribution. And we found that if you think about the middle quintile of households, which are similar to the middle quintile of households 10 years ago, these averages actually deteriorated for 70% of the population. The other thing to note is that this is a metric that looks at earned income or market income from wages and capital. Uh, government policies in terms of taxes and transfers did actually mitigate the worst effects of this over this 10-year period. So if you adjust for net taxes and transfers across the 25 economies we looked at, this ratio of 70% would come down to about 25%. 70% represents 500 million people across the advanced economies. 
but 25% is still about 200 million people. So even net of taxes and transfers, there was a real sense for many that life hadn't gotten better compared to households like them in the past. Just to give you a bit of uh, color about how this pans out, we deep dived into six economies. That was the US as well as five economies across Western Europe. This chart actually groups households by their positions in the income distribution, so by quintile of household. And uh, this shows you that from 93 up until 2005, uh, there was positive growth. That is, all these gray columns are above zero, so there was positive growth uh, in, in market income for all segments of households across all these six countries in that period. But if you look at the 2005 to 2014 period, you actually saw most economies with segments of households that were worse off. There are, of course, significant differences across countries. So very notable is the fact that in Italy, which faced the worst of a deep recession and a quadruple recession, so struggling to come out of it, virtually every segment, in fact, every segment, was actually below water or below zero. In contrast, Sweden, you just had one quintile, the bottommost quintile, that saw negative growth. All the other quintiles actually had positive growth. And for the other economies, including the US, you actually had uh, in the US, it was about 80% of households at the market income level who would have seen negative growth over this period. Now, how did that change with policies that uh, tried to transfer uh, and, and, and share more benefits through redistribution with these households? Well, it did change. In Italy, there was virtually no effect. Austerity actually uh, made the picture slightly worse, so all households continued to decline. Uh, in Sweden, uh, you had you know, the bottom quintile that were brought into positive ground. In France and the US, redistributional policies actually did help to keep a large, much larger proportion uh, in, in positive territory, but this was not the case in the UK and the Netherlands. So a bit more of variation based on how governments actually responded to this issue. But it doesn't take away from the fact that the underlying drivers of your own earned income were quite starkly negative across most of these countries. We also sort of validated or triangulated this finding by looking at groups of households on a different basis, not just in terms of where they were in the income distribution, but also based on demographic attributes. And we found that uh, two demographic attributes that we highlight here, the first is age. So you see the bottom, you know, less than 30-year-olds versus greater than 45-year-olds. And the second dimension was the educational attainment of the worker where the white bars are those who um, uh, you know, don't have a high school, uh, who haven't graduated from high school. The blue bars are those who do have a college degree. So uh, this suggests that workers actually who were younger and less educated uh, had much more adverse income trends. So everybody's income actually fell over this period on a like-to-like -like basis, but the younger, less educated workers actually suffered the most. And what was interesting is that the Overall income decline for the better educated workers really came from their hourly wage rates, which suggests that they found work, but perhaps they were doing work that, uh, you know, that they were too skilled for, so their wage rates actually declined. But for less educated workers, it was a combination of uh, unemployment as well as hourly wage rates, so they struggled to find work at all. And I think, uh, in line with the comment made, the third demographic that we did look at was gender, and in particular, single mothers in the US were 20 times more likely to be found in the lowest decile or quintile of the population uh, in income terms. And their incomes actually fell one to one and a half percentage points per year faster than that for the average household. So there was a gender uh, sort of implication or angle from, from a demographic perspective. Now, why is this important? This is, of course, important, the concept of advancing economically is important from the perspective of growth. And there are several studies that look at why this may be so, perhaps why this may not be so. But that wasn't the focus of, of our research. We delved deeper into some of the non-economic implications of this trend of a vast majority of households actually feeling they weren't advancing. So what we did uh, actually was to run a survey. We ran this in three countries. Uh, we did it in the US, France, and the UK. Um, and we asked people how they felt about whether they were advancing or not. Uh, so it's more a perception-based survey. 
And what came out was interesting. 30 to 40% of people actually said, yes, we are advancing. Another 25 to 30% were roughly neutral. But about 40% of respondents said that we, we feel worse off today than we were five to 10 years ago. And we feel worse off than our parents in many cases as well. So there was a sizable number that felt worse off. And they were more likely in that segment to be pessimistic about the future. So we found that the expectation about whether this will change or not turns out to be actually quite important in shaping attitudes. The segment not advancing was more likely to be pessimistic. And that was a not insignificant share of 10 to 15% of the entire population who believed that things would be worse off for their children as well. And how did that actually shape attitudes? We asked people how they felt about different aspects of um, you know, a, a more globalized economy. And we found that people who felt they weren't advancing and also were pessimistic about the future and about the prospects for themselves and their children were much more likely to have views that opposed immigration, foreign trade, or the influx of foreign labor. Uh, so again, a greater likelihood of being opposed to many of these things, less of a, I must say, less of a clear perception in their minds about how technology was impacting themselves and their, their lives, more confusion on that front. And this doesn't actually reflect the reality of the case, the evidence would suggest that these are not necessarily the biggest issues, but these were very entrenched perceptions. Uh, in, in the European economies, we did sort of test, you know, views on integration versus more kind of nationally determined policies. And we did find that uh, those who were in that segment were again two to two and a half times more likely to believe that withdrawal from the European Union was something that would actually uh, benefit them. Um, and, and, and this really brings me to the question of what caused this, right? Uh, what were the drivers that have led to this situation? Uh, and the first of these, which is what we call aggregate demand effects, is certainly the largest of these drivers. And maybe I should just skip to the next page, which shows you the numbers or the dimensions of each of these drivers for the US economy in particular. Here we look at the median income household, the classic middle income household, and we decompose how much of each of these drivers actually either contributed to positive income growth or negative income growth. The numbers on top of each of these circles is basically the trend in the past from 93 to 2005. The numbers below are the more recent decades trend. So aggregate demand is basically growth in the economy. It determines uh, labor force participation, employment, and the productivity or output of workers who are employed. This was a big positive in the past. It fell from 19 percentage points of you know, income boosting effect down to a positive of four percentage points. But what is interesting is while this was a collapse, it did, we did fall off the cliff in terms of growth, but you still were in positive territory. If all households had equally shared these effects of plus 4%, you wouldn't actually have the situation where 80% of households experienced uh, some notion of relative decline. The second factor is demographic effects, not significant in the US, but in many of the European economies, we did find that aging and changes in household structure did actually play a role not a big factor in the US. But labor market effects were a big factor in the US. And what is interesting is that they were a big factor not just in the recent decade, but even in the 10 or 15 years prior to that. What do we mean by labor market effects? We mean two things. One is for whatever growth is actually happening in the economy, what share of that actually went to labor versus returns to capital or returns for knowledge. And that share has declined and has been declining as we can see over the last 20 years. The second factor was how did the median income share of that wage pool actually change? And we found that there was an adverse trend here as well. So even for that declining share of wage income, the share of less skilled people actually consistently fell. And this has been a long-term trend for the European economy. Some of them, unfortunately, have caught up on this trend. So what was a positive earlier has become a negative now. Uh, and then the last of these effects was also significant from a positive perspective, which is the tax and transfer effect that I already talked about. Um, I don't have to belabor the point, but this chart really looks at the indexed value of wage, wages to GDP or compensation to labor as a share of GDP. For several countries, it's actually fallen. Uh, there are exceptions in France. You see this going sort of above the 100 indexed mark, but certainly for the US, this has fallen 
uh, over the long term. This point is really about the relative share of the median household. Given that the median household has a larger share of less educated people, uh, this kind of polarization, and a lot of this, by the way, driven by technology rather than globalization. The two are intimately linked, but technology certainly has a role to play in enhancing the premium in terms of wage premium or demand for high skill workers compared to low skill workers. Very marked trend in this direction uh, in the US. This is US data. Uh, and then finally, the tax and transfer piece. I think what is really striking here is if you look across this pool of economies, 40 to 50% of households were kept afloat essentially by taxes and transfers. A lot of that funded by debt, but debt levels, government debt levels have of course reached very high uh, levels across many of these economies. So how sustainable is that? Now, we are not forecasters and we are not really pollsters. Uh, and dare I say we are not experts, but I can't really say that, so we do have some expertise. But here's the view in terms of how likely is this to persist in future. We can't predict or forecast, but we did run some simulations and scenarios uh, and sensitivities, really. And what we found is, you know, if, if there is a scenario in which growth goes back to the pre-recession long-term high rates of growth and productivity growth and demand growth, and with that, some of these adverse labor market trends are actually stemmed and stalled and don't deteriorate further. You might have 70 to 80% of people across the advanced economies getting back on track in terms of getting better off. But on the other hand, if growth doesn't come back, of course, you know, that won't materialize. And finally, even if growth comes back, but there is the sense of disadvantage in terms of labor markets not working for less skilled people, you still have 30 to 40% of people who are likely to not advance. So this is not a problem that will go away necessarily without concerted action on multiple fronts. And what are those multiple fronts? We uh, don't have policy prescriptions, but we do tee up a set of potential um, areas, themes, uh, you know, priorities. Clearly something about measuring the phenomenon. Uh, there, has been, there is, of course, a lot of focus on GDP growth, on other macro metrics such as unemployment and so forth, but really the idea that are people getting better off and what is a sensible way to measure that and track it and make it a policy goal, that could be quite important. Reviving growth through productivity. We saw the numbers. It's a big determinant of you know, all, all, all boats kind of rising uh, or not. Uh, but I believe the rest of the discussion today and the second panel in particular will focus a lot on many ideas here. Uh, the third and fourth are actually also quite important, which is even if growth comes back, how do we ensure through education, uh, better linkages through, uh, uh, of education with employment and so forth, how do you actually help people to participate in that growth? This is as important as actually getting growth back. Um, and then there will be areas of redistribution that need to be examined, questioned, and some experimentation done because the answers and solutions aren't clear, but experimentation uh, and the report does talk about some of those ideas. Finally, I just want to emphasize this need for the business community to really step up and not be shy about thinking and talking about and doing something about income inequality. Uh, it's not an area that you know, business leaders have engaged on very actively, but we do believe that at least some of the solutions and certainly the fact that reviving local economies uh, will need private sector to work closely with local governments. So at different levels, we do need business leaders to engage and be constructive in this as well. So I'm going to stop here and really look forward to the discussion going forward. Thanks. Great, well, um, thank you for having me. Um, so I think what we're doing here at the CEA builds nicely, or my discussion builds nicely on the previous uh, uh, presentation. What I'm gonna talk about today is how we've been thinking about this and, and thinking about it more in the broader sense of what are the underlying explanations for this rising inequality. Um, so, as we know, there are many, many ways to measure inequality, but I think they all show upward trends over the past four decades. Um, in the US, the rising wage inequality is illustrated simply and starkly by this figure on the left, um, which is just hourly wages at the 90th, 50th, and 10th percentiles. 
Um, and what we see is that between 1979 and 2015, real wages for the highest earners, the 90th percentile of the wage distribution, grew by 42%. At the same time, median wages rose by 12%, while wages at the 10th percentile are up by just 4%. And the rising gap between the 90th percentile and those in the lower half of the distribution is also seen when we look at household income. So common measures of income inequality have grown by between 13 and 30% 30 since 1979. So the figure on the left, I think, is the one that we see all the time. On the right, we're just showing that no matter how you measure it, you're going to see the same pattern. So you can look at the Gini index, the 90-10 ratio, um, or pretty much any other measure, and you're going to see that we've had rising inequality. So I don't think this is news to, to any of us. Um, when we look at after taxes and transfers, things look a little bit better, but we still have, have a lot of work to do. Um, we see income inequality is still growing. So the graph on the left shows the top 1% share of income, both pre and post taxes and transfers. And the graph on the right shows the Gini coefficient, another measure of inequality. And in both cases, when you look at the after tax and transfers, things look better, but they're still the inequality is still increasing. Um, just to give you some numbers behind it, from the business cycle peak in 1979 to the business cycle peak in 2007, the after-tax and transfer income share of the top 1% more than doubled, and the after-tax and transfer genie rose by almost 30%. And so while taxes and transfers reduce inequality at any point in time, they offer only a partial correction that hasn't kept pace with the growth in market inequality in recent decades. So what I really want to focus on today is what we've been thinking about, which is the, are the causes of this underlying rise in inequality. And so the way that we're thinking about this is by breaking it into two components, the competitive and the non-competitive forces at work. And so I think we talk about all the time the competitive forces. So when I was a graduate student in, 19, in the 1990s, um, that was kind of the supply and demand framework. It was supply, demand, and institutions, and that's how you thought about it. And really, a lot was spent thinking about the supply and demand factors. So when we talk about competitive market forces, we're really just thinking about supply and demand shocks and, and the role um, of, of those in explaining rising inequality. And it's assuming that workers are paid their marginal product um, and, and, and that you know, we're always, we're always in, that, in that state of the world. Um, and so we know that this is a big part of what's going on. So we know there's been globalization, there's been skill bias, technological change. Um, and we can see that just by looking at the college earnings premium over time. So we know that the demand for skills, skill bias, technological change has increased the demand for skills. Um, as a result, the price of skills has increased and so the college earnings premium is at a record high. Um, the median full-time full-year worker over age 25 with a bachelor's degree earned roughly 70% more than a worker with just a high school degree in 2015. So it suggests we need more investment in skills that, that there really is an, a, a demand story going on here. I think, though, that we've thought about this a lot. There's a lot of research on this. So, so I'm not really going to spend any time on that. Um, what I wanted to talk more about are these non-competitive forces. And it isn't that we haven't been thinking about the non-competitive forces. We have. I mean, um, when we talk about unions, when we talk about minimum wages, that's inherently, I think, what we're thinking about. <coughs> but I think it's really nice to, to say it out loud and say, OK, what do we mean by non-competitive forces? Um, in this case, we're thinking about monopsony or wage setting power by the firm. So in the extreme case of monopsony, there's one firm who is hiring workers. And that's how we're, we're thinking about this from the labor perspective. Um, there's one firm hiring workers, and so they have a lot of say over how wages are determined. In the competitive case, workers are just um, firms are taking wages as given, and so they don't really have any wage setting power. In the monopsony case, firms actually exercise this wage setting power. And so, um, and as a result of that, we can end up with a very different outcome. So when we have employers with more bargaining power, 
what they may decide to do is hire fewer workers at lower wages. So I, I can basically say I, there are a lot of workers willing to work for cheap. I'm going to hire those workers. If I want to get more workers, I have to raise my wage, so it might not be worth it to me. Um, what we see is redistribution of worker wages to managerial earnings and profits. So now, because I can pay lower wages, um, I can extract more of the rents there. I'm going to end up with inefficient levels of employment because I'm going to hire too few workers. Um, and what we might see as a result of this is rising disparities of pay among workers with similar skills. So in my 10 minutes or so, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about this. This is something that CEA has written a recent issue brief on, so I'm going to plug that and encourage all of you to, to check that out online. Um, but we're really thinking about the role of this non, these non-competitive forces in driving wages and wage inequality. Um, okay. So again, this is a hypothesis that we think, we think there are these forces are at work. And I'm going to give you some suggestive evidence that this is true. Um, I think like uh, the competitive forces, we're not going to be able to pinpoint any one thing. I mean, there's been some nice work on skill bias, technological change, and other areas where you're trying to link a specific factor to declining or increasing wage inequality. This is more suggestive that the, the evidence seems consistent with this theory, um, so it seems like something important that we should be thinking about. I think we still need to do more work in this area. Um, some evidence that suggests this is true, and this follows from the, the last presentation as well, what you see is that the labor share of income has been declining over a long period of time. Um, but over the past 15 years, this decline in the labor share of national income has increased, re reaching its lowest level ever since World War II, though there have been signs of a reversal recently, so just a little uptick. But you can see that overall the trend is really been a declining trend. So workers are getting less of a share of GDP. When we think about why this might be, so what are the factors that are underlying this? What are the forces at work? Um, one is kind of a natural, or I don't know that I want to say natural, but is uh, a force that happens uh, because workers are unable to either find new jobs because of information barriers or have high moving costs. So in the competitive, in the competitive world, and if we think a really perfectly competitive market, your wage goes down a little bit, you're immediately going to transfer to a different firm where your wage will, is a little bit higher. So workers are perfectly mobile. Um, in reality, we don't think that's true, although it's funny when you think about um, as a labor economist, my default is always the perfectly competitive framework. But in reality, I think that's, that's probably very far from the truth. Um, there are a number of reasons that we think that jobs, uh, job switching might be costly. And I don't think that I need to explain too much why that would be. Um, one is information barriers. So you need to know where the next firm is and where, where you can go. So we think that that's not perfect. That might be improving over time with the internet and technological change. Um, but also, there are moving costs. There are switching costs to, um, to going to a different firm. And for some workers, this may, these costs may be higher. So um, there may be geographic costs. So moving is very costly, especially if you're moving across geographic areas. But also, transportation costs may be higher for certain groups of workers, or and so they may be very constrained in where they can look for firm look for work. Um, some examples of this are things like employer provided health insurance and a large literature on job locks. So for workers can't leave because they have health insurance in their in their with their employer and they may have some conditions that may make it very difficult for them to move. Um, other things may be regulations like occupational licensing that limits mobility. So I have a license to, to practice a particular trade or skill in one state that is not transferable to another state. So things like regulations and, um, and employer health insurance, things like that can make um, work, uh, firms have more, more wage setting power. There are also types of behaviors that employers can engage in to 
enhance their own wage setting power. So some examples of that and things that we've been thinking in, in, about at the White House are things like collusion, um, where basically, if uh, particularly in the case where firms are in, very concentrated in a particular industry or geographic area, they can get together and kind of agree to not raise wages or not poach. So some examples of this are recent court cases, um, including a suit brought against Silicon Valley employers, which alleged that no poaching agreements were used to avoid competitive bidding for programmers and engineers um, and to suppress their wages. Um, another set of lawsuits was settled by hospitals in several cities for allegedly colluding to fix the pay and wage growth of hospital nurses. So um, collusion is something that firms can do. It is not legal, so they shouldn't be doing it, but that doesn't mean that they aren't doing it. Um, what you see in these cases, there are particular circumstances where this is easier to do. So usually it would be where you would expect to see this if there is kind of concentrated firm power. So firms have market concentrated, product market concentration, but also the workers have a very specific skill set. So it makes it harder for them to move. So if you're a nurse and there are very few hospitals which you can work, the firms can collude and get and extract the rents um, from, from you. Um, and it's very costly for you to leave. Another example of empl something employers can do to increase their market um, or their wage setting power are non-compete agreements. And this is something that um, Treasury has written a report on that I, I found fascinating, and there's some recent research on this. Um, so as an economist, we think there are some plausibly good reasons why there should be non-compete agreements. So I have trade secrets, and so I don't want um, I don't want someone leaving my firm and going to a competing firm and basically taking all that knowledge. Um, the problem is it's very hard to think of circumstances why someone who makes sandwiches um, at the local deli has trade secrets and needs to, um, needs to uh, sign a non-compete agreement. So uh, Jimmy John's, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but there are a number of, of these places and so what we see is there's this, this proliferation of, of non-compete agreements where it's very hard to argue that there's a valid economic reason for this. And so um, in the report, they talk, Treasury talks about that there are valid reasons that you might expect this and it could be good to have non-compete agreements. However, you know, it, they are far too um, uh, prevalent to kind of warrant that. Um, so research by, by Evan Starr and others have shown that one in five workers are currently covered by a non-compete agreement, um, and about 15% of those earning less than $40,000 a year. So there are workers um, who, are, who clearly do not have trade secrets who are, who are signing these non-compete agreements. Um, even in states, and this is what I think is even more surprising, where they're not enforceable workers are signing these non-compete non agreements. And so you might say, well, why do they sign them? They don't need to, or who cares if they're signing them? But the workers believe that they are enforceable. So it's, it doesn't have to be that um, they are enforceable. It just has to kind of scare the workers enough not to leave for competitors. Um, so, and the prevalence in California is as high as it is in other states. So it's not like this is just the rare exception. Um, What's also interesting is that a lot of workers are signing these after they start their job or are, don't even know if they're covered by a non-compete agreement. So this idea of worker information is really important in terms of um, thinking about kind of workers' ability to move to different jobs. Okay, so, so those are the theory of, of um, the non-competitive case. So the evidence that I'm gonna present is really suggestive evidence, but I think makes you think that there's really something going on. So um, the non-compete, the existence of non-competes in such a, a large, um, large scale, the fact that um, we've seen occupational licensing rising over time and in places where you really think there's not a health or safety reason for these things to happen, um, the declining share, labor share of income, 
Um, here's some evidence on declining worker mobility. So again, labor um, perfectly competitive theory says, well, they should be willing to move, and so workers should move, and that'll keep their wages high. Um, what we see is, and there's some really good recent research on this by Raven Malloy and her co-authors, as well as John Holtzwanger and co-authors, documenting declining worker mobility. And so um, evidence from multiple sources shows that workers today are less likely to leave a job or move to a new job than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, geographic mobility has also seen a decades-long decline. Industry occupation and employer transitions have fallen markedly over a similar period with declines in those measures accelerating in the 1990s. Um, so we see workers less likely to move. What that could be is that they're finding great matches, right? So this could be a good thing if everyone has moved, found the perfect job because now I have monster.com or whatever the internet, I think that might be a 1990s search tool, but um, whatever the latest internet job search website is, I'm getting, finding the perfect match so I don't need to move. Um, and so that could be a good thing. It depends on why workers aren't moving. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be what's going on. So when we look at, and when I say we, I mean researchers, when other researchers have looked at the relationship between wages and labor market conditions, what they find is that today workers' wages look are more closely related to the labor market conditions when they started than they used to be. So wages are not responding to labor market conditions. It's not that I'm in my perfect job and so they want to keep me so as wages go up, they raise my wages and I'm very happy to stay there. What's happening is I'm in a job and the wages aren't going up and I'm not moving. And so something is going on that, that is keeping me from moving to a different job. And so when we look at these declines, both across occupations, industries, employers, and across all levels of geography, I think we need to worry. Okay. We also see declines in unionization and the real value of minimum wage, which are two things that kind of countered the increased bargaining power or kind of put, held at bay the increased bargain, um, wage setting power of firms. So historically, if you look at the figure on the left, it's union membership as a share of total employment, and um, which is the bottom line on the left, and the top is the bottom 90% share of income. So um, union membership was related to the share of income by the bottom 90%. So this is just a correlation that I'm showing you. Um, but the idea behind unions is that they enable workers to bargain collectively. Um, and they can monitor workplaces and, and do things like that. And we've clearly seen a decline in the past uh, at least 20 years, 30 years. Um, I guess in the past 60 years, union membership fell from 25% to 10% of total employment. So that's one sort of worker protection that, that's been declining. The other is the real value of the federal minimum wage. So if we set a floor, obviously firms can't or shouldn't set the wage below that. Um, and we know that that's been declining. So the real value of the federal minimum wage has declined 24% since its peak. Um, in 1968. So what can we do or what have we done? Well, um, I wouldn't be a good uh, administration employee if I didn't highlight all the progress that we actually have made in the last uh, almost eight years. Um, this highlights the changes in tax policy and the effects of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and what we can see is the tax policy and the Affordable Care Act have actually done a significant amount to reduce inequality. That being said, there's still a lot to be done. So let me just explain to you what you see here. The left is the change in the share of, of after-tax income by percentile. And in these calculations, all we're taking into account are taxes, tax changes, and the Affordable Care Act. Um, so things like invest longer run strategies like investment in education and training that we've made are not reflected in these figures. So we view this as a conservative estimate of what's been going on and we're comparing 2009 to 2017. Um, the second figure is the same numbers but presented in a slightly different way where it's the change in the after-tax income by percentile. Um, 
And so what we see is we've increased the tax rates at the, the very top, and we've helped at the bottom with providing health insurance, as well as um, a number of tax credits like expanding the EITC and the CTC. Um, so changes in tax policy and the coverage provisions of the ACA um, will increase the after-tax income received by the bottom 99% of families by 1.2 percentage points in 2017 relative to what it would have been under the continuation of 2008 policies. The income share of the top 1% will decrease by the same amount. And these policies will boost income for families in the bottom 20% by 18%, equivalent to more than a decade of average income gain. So we have made some real progress on these dimensions, and I think that's important to highlight. That being said, there is still a lot left to do. So this is a little bit old. It's from 2010. But this is just highlighting that the US really doesn't do very much. And I think this builds on the last presentation that the US really um, is not doing nearly as much as other countries. So the, the little dot is um, uh, uh, market income. Huh. Is this right? So the market income is the blue, and the, um, the red is the plus taxes and cash transfers. And so you can see that inequality goes down with cash with ta um, when you take into account taxes and transfers. Um, the U.S. has relatively high inequality of market income, as was noted in the previous, um, and, but, and we have one of the highest after-tax and transfer inequality of major advanced economies. So we really still need to do a lot more. What should we do? Um, well, we have a whole host of things that we should do that um, I am... Um, continued investment in education and skills that boost productivity. So all of these are focused on, so the taxes and transfers really can help, but what we want to do is improve market income. So we don't need the taxes and transfers. These are the policies that we think would, would make a difference. Investing in education, um, we saw the really high returns to college, um, apprenticeship and job trainings, um, and job training, expanding you know, UI to help workers transition to different jobs. So we have a whole bunch of proposals that we've put out. Um, promotion of competition in the labor market. So this is addressing the, the non-competitive forces. The skills investment is kind of trying to get at the competitive forces. Um, facilitate independent antitrust enforcement, reform non-compete laws. You may notice a number of these things are state-level policies, so we've really been engaged with the states to try to come up with guidance and best practices, improve transparency and in worker information, enhance worker mobility through the Affordable Care Act, um, provide information about occupational licensing and land use restrictions, because um, land use regulations are another form of regulation that may hinder mobility. So if there are good jobs in an area but I can't find any housing there, I'm not gonna move there. Um, and then support institutions that counter wage setting power like workers' rights to collective bargain and increasing the federal minimum wage. So I think, I think we've made, we've made a, a significant progress but there's, there's a lot left for us to do. Well, thank you very much, Adam and Caroline. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, slightly different from the previous presentations, and I'm hoping that it's going to be actually quite complementary. So the previous presentations have focused on developments in inequality within countries, within the advanced economies in particular, uh, and I've learned a lot. Um, and uh, they have also done a very uh, deep, job in trying to understand where those changes in inequality have come from in terms of the driving forces. So what I'm going to do is different because I'm going to focus a lot less on the past and I'm going to focus a lot more on the future. Uh, and it's also different because I'm really going to uh, look at the global income distribution. So uh, I'm not just focusing on developments within countries, I'm focusing uh, 
uh, really on the worldwide income distribution. Um, and this is an approach that has become a little bit more standard uh, with the work of Branko Milanovic and others, uh, but it is still something that uh, is in its infancy. Uh, the idea is that you line up everybody, every individual uh, in the world from the poorest to the richest, and you look at the distribution of individual, uh, of individual incomes uh, worldwide. Now, why is that interesting? Uh, why is that important? Well, I think it's important from a moral standpoint. I think uh, I personally do care about the global income distribution. I care about people outside of the country that I live in. Um, and uh, beyond that, though, it's not just a moral issue. I think it's also a, an issue for policymakers, for businesses, and so on. And the reason is that how changes in incomes are distributed among the world's individuals has very powerful implications for what people spend on. We know that the kinds of items that people spend on depend on their individual incomes. So what I'm going to show today is I'm going to be projecting the global income distribution. Uh, if you're patient and you come back in a couple of months when we uh, launch our book, I will then trace the implications of that global in income distribution for consumption patterns, infrastructure needs, and so on. But today I'm just going to focus on what happens to the global income distribution. In a nutshell, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, existing projections uh, for each country in the world from experts. Uh, so I'm not going to make my own projections, uh, but I'm going to take them from the consensus of economists and demographers uh, for what is going to happen to output and population country by country for all the countries in the world. I'm going to take those as inputs. Um, and then the other uh, much more time-consuming kind of input that I'm going to use is the income distribution from household surveys. So we go to the Luxembourg Income Study, which is kind of the gold standard for, uh, for this kind of business. We use some data from the World Bank, and we look uh, at household surveys, and we figure out, for example, a country like Poland has a fairly uniform income distribution. A country like India has a lot of poor, but a lot of super rich. So we take those things into account, and we put them together, and we project uh, the global income distribution so that 20 years from now, I can tell you, uh, the consensus of the economics profession is that there will be, let's say, uh, X million of people in India who are earning between $10,000 and $15,000 a year. So that's where we're going. Um, so let me try to give you a bit of a feel for the inputs uh, to begin with. I like to begin by showing the projections for population. And uh, here you will notice that in most countries in the world, population is not going to grow a whole lot over the next 20 years, except in India, where there's going to be an increase by 300 million and some other parts of South Asia. Uh, and then there's a population explosion coming up in Sub-Saharan Africa. So today, Sub-Saharan Africa has 900 million people, uh, and there will be 1.6 billion in 2035. Some of you have heard me say this before. I repeat it. I will repeat it again. It's very important that we keep that into account because it is going to be transformational, not just for that continent, but for the world economy. The second input that I need is projections for output. And here I... Um, I take the consensus forecast from OECD, other international organizations, the firm consensus forecasts, and so on. And you know, it really doesn't matter exactly which firm you look at. Uh, economists tend to agree on future developments in output in the uh, in the next 20 years for a particular for a particular country. Of course, there's a huge uncertainty around the baseline projection. We know that. Uh, and of course, we'll do plenty of sensitivity analysis and so on. But this is what the consensus of the profession is in terms of per capita GDP growth. 
uh, the consensus is that the advanced economies will keep growing more slowly than the emerging markets. You see very rapid growth in India, China, and so on. Now, add population growth to that, uh, and you get uh, total output growth being the fastest in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, East Asia, and so on. And again, we can debate whether a particular number is right or not for any individual region or country, we've done uh, scenarios in which we can play with these projections. The bottom line is that uh, it doesn't really make that much difference uh, to what I'm going to show you as long as the changes are not uh, sort of completely out of what the uh, profession is thinking right now. Uh, so let me begin with where we are today in terms of the worldwide income distribution. And this is kind of the analysis that some of you are familiar with from uh, the uh, elephant uh, chart line of work that uh, Paul is going to talk about uh, as a starting point uh, at, at lunchtime. So what does the worldwide income distribution look like? Uh, well, there are a lot of very poor people in the world uh, and very few rich people. In fact, uh, most of the people in this room would probably be outside of this graph. Uh, the median income for uh, the world as a whole is about $2,000. And uh, the mean is $7,000. Uh, the US poverty line is about 6,000 per person. So you have the three quarters of the world's population are below the official US poverty line. It's kind of a reality check. Uh, well, uh, what do we find when we take all of those assumptions and, uh, and, and project it forward? Um, this is what you get. You get that the uh, worldwide income distribution is going to become a little bit more equal. And uh, specifically what we find is that uh, there will be um, about 500 million less people in abject poverty. So today there are 900 million people whose income is less than $2 a day. There will be 400 million uh, in 2035. The median will double uh, approximately, and so will the mean. Um, I should have added a little bit about uh, one important assumption that we make because it's central to uh, the previous presentations and the discussion today. So one of the assumptions we make in, in doing this exercise has to relate to what we think is going to happen to within country uh, income distribution. And there we can go in two ways. Uh, the baseline is to be very agnostic and is to say, we think that the income distribution within individual countries is not going to change over the next 20 years. Uh, if you've heard the previous discussions, you may be led to think that we're kind of crazy because there have been very large changes over the past. Well, actually, that is a misperception. It is true that income distribution has become much more unequal within the United States, within the United Kingdom, and so on. But if you look worldwide, even within the advanced economies, the picture is much more mixed. Uh, if you look at uh, Germany or Italy over the past 15, 20 years, and if you look at the Gini coefficient for the Luxembourg income study, actually that has not changed. It has not changed. Uh, if you do the numbers, uh, you find that the most pronounced increases in the Gini coefficient have occurred prior to the 1990s. Um, so if you start counting how many countries have seen worsening in income distribution and how many countries have seen improvements in income distribution, it's actually pretty mixed. And all of the studies that have tried to relate uh, changes in income distribution to various factors, at the end of the day, it's not quite clear that we can project the factors, the underlying factors going forward. So I think it's pretty reasonable to take an agnostic standpoint as an assumption. There is an alternative way, which is very well grounded in the economics profession, which is to look at the so-called Kuznets curve. And as you will know, the Kuznets curve says that as countries become richer, as we go from an agricultural society to a more industrialized society, inequality starts becoming uh, 
uh, more pronounced. Um, some people become rich, but the bulk of the population remains stuck in poverty, so inequality initially increases. And then uh, at later stages of development, when you start being an advanced economy, maybe you set up a welfare state, at that point, inequality starts declining. That's what the Kuznets curve uh, type of analysis uh, would show. We've done that, um, and we've estimated Kuznets curves. We find some results. Uh, and as you would imagine, what we find is that countries such as China and India are pretty much at the peak of the Kuznets curve. So if you believe that line of literature, which has a long-standing tradition in economics, uh, by the way, we find an even stronger uh, fit for the Kuznets curve because of the high quality of the data that, that we have. If you believe that, actually the decline in uh, inequality is going to be even more pronounced than, than what I'm showing here in my baseline. So uh, if you have an intuition for Gini coefficients, not everybody does, but if you have an intuition for Gini coefficients, this is what happens to global income inequality. We know from the work of Lackner and Milanovic that uh, income inequality has remained stable between 1988 and 2003. And then kind of at the turn of the century, income inequality globally has started declining. And we have data through 2015 now, so we can document that it has actually declined quite strongly. Um, and we project that it will continue declining um, until 2035, under our assumptions, of course. How big is this improvement in global income inequality? Uh, it's about, what, seven Gini points. Um, if you have an intuition for that, it's about equivalent to the worsening in the Gini coefficient that we have observed within the United States between 1979 and today. It's about, uh, it's actually a little bit larger than uh, the change in uh, what happened in Mexico. By five Gini points, Mexico became more equal over that same period that I referred to earlier. So it's pretty large. It's a pretty significant uh, change in global income inequality. The main driving force is, uh, of course, the fact that some of the most populous uh, countries in the world uh, are growing faster than the advanced economies. Uh, the country that is doing the most work in this is India. Uh, China actually was a big driving force in this change over the past uh, period, but going forward it doesn't matter so much because China's median income is about the same as the median for the world as a whole. So anyway, um, another way to summarize these results is that the 90 to 10 ratio, uh, the, re the ratio of uh, somebody who's in the 90th percentile to somebody who's at the 10th percentile uh, is about 29 today, um, and it will become 25 by the end of the projection period. So significant improvement in global income inequality, not as much as one would hope, perhaps, uh, but it is going to be significant. And hopefully this helps uh, put a bit of a more hopeful spin on the uh, discussions that we hear within the advanced economies. Um, perhaps we want to talk about policies in the, um, in the discussion, but I will just mention a couple of uh, points, depending on how much time I have. I'll assume I have one minute. Uh, and uh, from the policy side, of course, within countries, we know what to do about redistribution. And uh, in fact, the previous presentation did a wonderful job in doing that, in talking about the role of the uh, tax system transfers, means-tested transfers, and so on, uh, but also in terms of affecting policies that have an impact on market income, so uh, early education, antitrust, uh, deregulation of certain parts of the labor market, uh, avoiding collusion, creation of rents, and so on. So we know what to do within countries. Across countries, direct redistribution is very difficult. Uh, the main mechanism that has been tried in the past is aid, and we know that 
different people have different views on the effectiveness of aid. Um, I will give you one statistic from this uh, kind of work, which is that if you impose a 1% tax on the world's top 1%, and hypothetically you can identify exactly who are the very poor people in the world, you can eliminate completely poverty as defined by the $2 a day line. And I think most of us would be happy to do that. I think everybody would say, I will pay that tax, it's not a problem. Why can't we do that? It's because we don't know how to identify the people who need the money. We don't have the IDs, and we don't know how to make those transfers without leakage. But just to get a sense of uh, sort of the scale of the redistribution that might be needed. I think uh, more concretely, things that can be done um, are uh, in the area of redistribution defined generally are things like uh, making sure that global corporations pay a fair share of taxes. Uh, so initiatives such as the BEPS uh, are in the right direction. And why is that useful? It's because it generates resources that then countries can redeploy either to aid or uh, to things like infrastructure investment or to other policies that can do something to, uh, to alleviate poverty and redistribute incomes. So that's one. Uh, the other is to then focus on countries' ability to grow. So policies such as fostering infrastructure, um, international trade, and so on. That's for a longer discussion. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought that was on. Um, so there's a roving mic here and a mic in the back. And I'm just going to start by asking one question to the presenters that didn't come up that I think is very important, which is about regional disparities. So one thing we saw in the U.S. election as well as in Brexit uh, was that the rural areas voted... Uh, distinctly uh, against um, uh, liberalism or globalization or these kinds of things, yet in the case of Brexit, they're also the ones that have benefited from, from transfers. Um, and I'm wondering, Anu, if you looked at where incomes have been falling, differences between rural and urban, and um, Sandra, your, your chart on mobility was really striking. And one thing I've noticed is if you look at rents or uh, house, housing prices, so I bought a house at the same time as two of my friends, one who's in New York and one who's in Maine. Mine, since 2001, roughly doubled in value. My friend in New York's more than tripled in value. And my friend in Maine is, is flat and actually cousins in Georgia, rural Georgia, have seen their, their house prices decline. So my question is, I think it becomes much harder to move because of our, our, our system, perhaps, of subsidizing mortgages. So I just wanted to ask you both about regional disparities and maybe actually even Paolo to the extent that maybe the future world is not one of countries but ones of cities and the rest. And if you thought about that. And then we'll move to the audience. Thank you. I, I think that's actually a great question and also, uh, I think, a question that does merit more work. Um, 
when we looked at it, uh, we looked at three micro data sets. So in addition to the income distribution data that we looked at for a larger set of countries, we looked at micro data sets in the US uh, as well as two other European countries. And we did investigate whether rural and urban or some kind of geographical or regional sort of presence is a big determinant. It did turn out that the stronger determinants were age and education. And education in particular is in turn possibly correlated with some of the regional or geographic inequalities. Um, so what we quantified was using the educational cut, uh, but, but I think it's, it's, it's a very fair question and it's something that, that should be investigated at a more granular level. So I, I completely agree that we need more work on this. Uh, we know that the regional variation is important and I think the, the work by Raj Chetty and others recently kind of getting the micro data and looking and seeing how important these things are um, and I think it highlights that it's not, and this will go back to what you're probably going to talk about, but that the federal government is not the only thing we should be thinking about, that a lot of this is more local level and um, requires states and even localities to, to think more carefully about their regulations and how to facilitate across uh, movement across cities and also even within cities um, to help kind of smooth those frictions. So I, I don't have any estimates, but what the impressions are that uh, uh, some of the developing research at this point, uh, things like infrastructure that make it possible for people who live in uh, society to participate in the modern economy, there are things that also tend to improve uh, income distribution. I think that's, uh, that's the link. Okay, why don't we go ahead and open it up to questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that excellent presentation. My name is Joe Winder. Um, there's an argument being made that I've heard that one of the reasons for the growing income dis uh, inequality in the United States is because of the philosophy, corporate philosophy, uh, which between the end of World War II and say the mid 70s was one where gains in productivity were shared more or less equally between management and labor. And the term that I've heard used is that was stakeholder capitalism. Uh, whereas after 1970 and beyond, there was a growing trend among the corporate management to move toward shareholder capitalism where virtually most of the gains, if not all, of productivity increases were going to upper level management and the workers' share declined substantially. Uh, have you found any of those effects and do they seem meaningful? Sandra, do you want to take that? It seems to fit with what you're... So I, I can't speak to um, the data on that, but I think it's consistent with this idea that that what we see is a decline in in, um, in worker bargaining power. I think it's important to remember or to think that we don't want to count on the the generosity of firms and expect the generosity of firms to to help the workers. That would that would be very nice, but uh, but I think I think our expectation is not that that's happening, or certainly if. It, happening less than, than it may have been in the past. Just to add, add to that perspective, so it's certainly true that the data suggests that the share of labor in the total pool of output has declined. Uh, to what extent is that sort of structural changes in the economy uh, that drive that? Because there has also been a trend over this period of, for a variety of reasons like um, you know, a low cost of capital, the continuously declining cost of capital goods, including ICT, uh, and globalization itself, which has promoted a focus on capital and knowledge intensive activities in the developed economies. So all of these have actually influenced that declining structural element of wages in the total output pool. And it's kind of hard, I think, to disaggregate how much of that was actually management action. 
Uh, but it's certainly true, and as, as Sandy mentioned, the, you know, if you think about union density or union membership as a perhaps imperfect proxy of the bargaining power of labor, I think what was interesting in the data was that uh, it varies quite a lot across countries. And if you think about the European countries where there is a lot of variation, in the US it was already low and it's declined further. But in Europe there have been two countries that we looked at, the UK and the Netherlands, where union membership actually fell uh, most steeply in the last 10 years. And those were actually cases which didn't do so well in terms of economic advancement. Sweden, on the other hand, has amongst the highest you know, rates of union membership. And also, I think a very constructive way in which uh, corporations work with unions and the government to kind of come up with approaches in response to economic shocks. So it's definitely something to investigate. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Jo Marie Grease Grabber. I'm with New Rules for Global Finance. And I'm delighted to see the number of women on this panel. <laughs> and you're still an integrated panel. Uh, end of comment. I have two questions. One is how, I thought the antitrust laws were dead. Um, how do you do that at the state level in the United States? Do antitrust at the state level? Never heard of that, but I'm curious. The other thing, I'd like to ask you to square the circle between the increased labor flexibility that Paolo talks about and the need for greater uh, uh, power to workers through unions, which even the IMF and some of its research has talked about. How do you bring those two together? Um, it seems like you're talking opposite ends. So for... It so I, I don't think antitrust is dead, um, and uh, and and I didn't I didn't mean to suggest that that was a state. I was more referring to regulations like licensing regulations and and those type of uh, regulations are state level. There are definitely federal regulations that that we need to to think about as well. So I didn't I misspoke if I suggested that was. Um, in terms of worker flexibility, I think you bring up a really important point, which is that the workforce is changing and we need to think about how that changing workforce interacts with, uh, with this, the labor system that we have in place. And that's something the, the workforce is, the, for example, the on-demand economy with things like Uber, still a very small share of our, our workforce now and so not something that that is as big as maybe the news would let you think it is, but um, certainly something that you need to think about and things like portability of benefits and things like that. So the job lock literature from the 1980s and 1990s is all the more important now when you think about the Affordable Care Act and how it enables workers to transition and, and move more easily across jobs. The, the idea of portable benefits, I think, is really important and something that we need to think about more going forward. So I think that's a really important point. Paula, did you have one more? Um, my name is Mary Shirley. I'm with the Ronald Coase Institute. And my question is for Paolo about his optimistic scenario about uh, the future for income distribution. How much does your projection rely on an optimistic scenario for Africa? And could you talk more about why you think that's realistic, given that in my past experience with the World Bank and the research department, there were lots of occasions where we were optimistic about Africa and were frequently disappointed? Thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I remain bullish about the continent. Uh, that's my personal view. Um, the very first uh, study that I did when I came here to the Peterson Institute uh, documented that uh, as economists, we tend to be overly optimistic about uh, long run forecasts for emerging markets and we estimated exactly by how much. Um, so uh, one of the scenarios that we do in, in this exercise is exactly to say, well, suppose that we, uh, my baseline is just as overly optimistic as the previous rounds of over optimism, then what would happen? And what you get if you do that exercise is that global income distribution, as you're correctly pointing out, is going to decline a little bit less. I don't remember the exact number. It's still declining, 
uh, but not as powerfully as, as I showed. Um, now, on the forecast for Africa specifically, the chart I showed is still from our working paper of a couple of years ago, which predates the decline in commodity prices. Um, the specific forecasts, uh, therefore, would have to be revised a little bit down. I think that that would be logical. Uh, I'm not prepared to say that they're going to be collapsing. Um, I think that within sub-Saharan Africa, you have various groups. You have oil exporters, which happen to be the largest economies uh, at the moment. Uh, so it certainly has an impact. Uh, but you have large groups of countries that are oil importers for whom things are actually still going pretty well. You still have several countries growing at 7% a year. So we don't know. Uh, I think the, the exact forecast that I gave is a little bit optimistic because it was from a couple of years ago. But I, we've done an exercise in which we have sub-Saharan Africa go immediately to the global mean of the past 30 years. And uh, just the way the numbers come out, you still get a decline in global income uh, inequality, although not as pronounced as what I showed. Hi, Sarah Gamage, International Center for Research on Women. I have two very brief questions. One for Sandy, really about the portability of pensions and the fragmentation of pensions. Did you get a chance to look at that as one reason why you might have greater sort of job lock? And another one for Paolo, which is really about migration and remittances as part of that potential scenario of what could equalize or sort of reduce inequality in global income. Thanks. So we haven't looked at data on portability of pensions, um, but I think that is a natural issue to be thinking about, which is, I mean, we've seen um, a decline in defined benefits and increase in defined contribution, and that's something we think about in terms of kind of um, worker voice. So workers are now increasingly incurring the risks on, on that dimension. Um, and that's, that's definitely something we're thinking about. You know, we talk about and we, we've um, uh, supported state IRAs, so states, so that, that everyone has access to an IRA account. Um, but I, I think that's a natural, you know, the ACA is a first step um, providing portable health insurance, but these are all things that, that we need to think about. So the question was about remittances and migration. So let me say a couple of things on, on both of those. First, remittances are important um, for some countries. We don't have exact data on remittances. Of course, that's part of the income that is reported in the surveys, but we don't have the exact breakdown. I think on remittances, what I would say is that there's good work done at the World Bank uh, that documents how expensive it is for people to send money home. And it's pretty scandalous. It's, it's really very, very expensive. So it, it is important we find ways of reducing the cost for people to send money home, which is a way in which we improve welfare. Um, on migration, the projections of population come from the United Nations. The underlying assumption is that migration is not going to be rising tremendously over the next years. My personal view is that we may see greater migration flows than what is assumed uh, in, the, in the United Nations uh, baseline projections. And the reason I say that is that um, the recent work done um, by some, some experts, uh, uh, including Michael Clements, uh, shows that as people become a little bit less poor, that's when they start migrating. So just as I showed, as a lot of people are going to be lifted out of poverty, that's when they can start contemplating migration. And therefore, my projection, even if I don't have exact numbers, is that we're going to see a massive increase in migration flows. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our time here. So if you have really quick questions, what we can do is take the last two in succession and then give uh, the presenters just a chance to say their, their last words. Okay. I hope they're quick. Uh, what, just one, not they. Just one. Well, I have two no, for Sandy. Pick one. 
<laughs> uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, Rakesh Kocha with the Pew Research Center. <laughs> and I guess down to one then, uh, you talk about the decline in labor mobility, which has been on a long-term linear downward trend. Uh, corresponding to that, what do we know about changes in farm mobility or plant mobility? Is the, are those countervailing or are they complementing each other on the, and you know, how does that correspond to your story on monopsony? Why don't we take the other question first? Thanks very much, Carolyn. Uh, Sherry Stevenson, ICTSD, Geneva. Uh, my question is to well, both Anna and Sandy, in terms of your policy recommendations of how we could think of increasing the share of labor in total GDP or income, you've both put uh, increasing productivity on top of your list. But we have this conundrum in terms of productivity. It's been basically flat for a long time. So if we know about this, one, how do we do it, and why haven't we been doing it? Okay, so why don't we allow you to go down the panel and, and wrap up in the same order we started. So if Anu wants to start, and then we can go down and wrap up. Thanks. I, I think I'll start at the tail end of the question, which is how do we do it, which is, of course, a much longer answer, and I probably won't, won't get into that. But it certainly is true that raising productivity is a crucial part of the answer. And we've seen this across not just the advanced economies where productivity or measured productivity growth has been a big challenge, but also in developing countries. We've done deep work in India, for example, that suggests that the pathway to much of what Paolo was talking about, which is you know, how do you really improve the income distribution there, 70% of that answer is about productivity. So certainly at that end of the global income distribution, uh, raising productivity is a big part of the answer. We would believe that it is also the case in, in advanced economies. But hand in hand with that, I don't, you know, I think the, the whole kind of, I, I think the heart of it is that the, the traditional or historical relationship between wage growth and productivity is broken. And as you really think about, therefore, the link, I mean, what, what implication does this have for education and skills? It's massive because it's not just young people where that link is broken between education and employment, but it's also a vast number of you know, middle-aged people or people who are facing these kind of disruptions in the job market. So I think the answers have got to be around how those links actually work better. Um, so to, I, I agree with, with what Anu was saying. Um, in terms of, of productivity, I mean, I think we know we need more investment. We know we need um, investment in capital and investment in skills. And I think, again, if we knew how, if there was an easy answer, um, things would probably be better now um, on that dimension. So um, in terms of firm mobility, I think we see declining movement even within industry across firms. So I think, I think that's not something that, that has been going on um, overall. So I don't think, I don't think that is, is something that that can uh, that is offsetting in any way what the patterns that we see. So. Alrighty, thank you. I call this session adjourned, and we will meet for the next session in fifteen minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.